Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So, welcome everyone to session four of our course, the foremost series of all. Um, today we're talking about um, Kema Bhikkhuni, the chief disciple of the Buddha and also the nun foremost in wisdom. So as usual, I will share my screen and then we can start right away. Oh. So today, what I want to do with you today is uh, to look at, first of all, to look at the early texts. So we are very fortunate that we have two early texts uh, about Kema, one is her Terigata poem, and the other one is a sutta that she gives to King Pasenadi, which is found in the Samyutta Nikaya of the Pali tradition. And this sutta does not have any parallel. So we are very fortunate that it survived at least in one tradition, the Pali tradition. And once we have looked at the early texts, I want to compare that with the Apadana literature which of course are texts that were written many, many centuries after the Buddha's lifetime. And so I want to compare first with the Apadana of the Pali school, the Theravada school, um, and compare how things changed over the centuries between the early texts and the later texts. And then also compare with another Apadana from another school, from a Sanskrit text called the Avadana Sataka, and see how um, her life story is um, conceptualized differently in different schools of Buddhism. So if there's a common core or if they are completely different and that will help us also see at like at what point in time those Apadana literature, uh, this Apadana literature was developed. And if there's time, we will also um, make a short excursion into the Chinese Vinaya um, because the Vinaya texts are quite interesting here. Um, in the Pali tradition, generally, um, there is a very clear distinction between the good nuns, the foremost nuns, those you know highly accomplished nuns on the one side and the, the bad nuns, the misbehaving nuns on the other side. So usually we don't find the foremost nuns um, in the Vinaya as you know, people who misbehave and as people for whom um, rules had to be laid down. But in the Chinese Vinayas, the situation is very different. So we regularly see rules being laid down. There are even rules uh, being laid down for Mahapajapati and also some being laid down for Kema and for other of the famous bhikkhunis. So it's like we can see a completely different side of that bhikkhuni when we look into the Chinese Vinayas. So if there's time, we'll do that. Um, there might not be time, but uh, if there's no time today, we'll definitely do it when we talk about Bata Kapilani. So yeah, we'll have to see how things go. Um, so as I mentioned, Kema is the foremost of the nuns with great wisdom, and she's found with that same quality in all of the lists that we looked at two weeks ago. And of course, she's also one of the female chief disciples of the Buddha. She's the female counterpart to um, Sariputta. And then of course, the other two are Mahamogalana and Upalavana. And Upalavana um, is the nun we are going to talk about next week. So we will start right away with um, her Terigata poem, uh, and which is uh, 6.3. And I'm using Bhante Suchato's translation here. And so uh, her poem has six stanzas. And actually, when we look at the poem, we will see that it's not actually one poem, it's actually two poems that were put together because they're, they're both attributed to Kema. And the two mm, poems are quite different. 
So one poem is four stanzas and the other is um, two stanzas. And so we will look at them separately and we will look at the first one first. Um, and this first one is uh, so interesting because it follows a pattern that we see in another text, uh, which is called the Bhikkhuni Samyutta. So that is found in the Samyutta Nikaya of the Pali tradition. And it has two Chinese parallels and the texts are also found in the Tibetan tradition. So it's very well um, attested in all the traditions. And the Bhikkhuni Samyutta is a collection of 10 suttas uh, which, in which the main characters are all Bhikkhunis. So it's kind of, uh, special, of special interest for Bhikkhuni studies. And in all the 10 suttas, they all follow the same pattern. So in all of the 10, uh, Bhikkhuni goes into the forest. She wants to meditate in seclusion. And then Mara comes, Mara the trickster god, who is always trying to disturb people and to make sure that they don't practice the Buddha's path. So he comes and he tries to disturb them, but because all of the Bhikkhunis are Arahants, they all uh, see through his, um, his tricks and they call him out. And so in the end he has to leave and he, he's defeated. So um, all of the 10 suttas in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta follow the same pattern and here, in the Terigata, which is a different scripture, we have Kema's poem, which also follows the same pattern, even though Kema is not a nun who appears in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta. So we don't really know why her verses weren't included in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, because it would make sense to have her there. Um, but we're kind of lucky that we have her here in the Terigata anyway. And um, yeah, we can speculate a bit later why her, her verses weren't included there, but I'm going to read the poem first now. So um, the first stanza is spoken by Mara and it goes as follows. You're so young and beautiful. I too am young, just a youth. Come Kema, let us enjoy the music of a five piece band. So Mara has transformed himself into a handsome young man here. And Kema replies, this body is rotting, ailing and frail. I'm horrified and repelled by it. And I've eradicated sensual craving. Sensual pleasures are like swords and stakes. The aggregates are their chopping block. What you call sensual delight is now no delight for me. Relishing is destroyed in every respect and the mass of darkness is shattered. So know this wicked one, you're beaten, Terminator. So, um, this is uh, Kima's poem by which uh, she um, refutes Mara and makes him leave. And just now I mentioned that her, her poem as such isn't found in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, but actually all those verses that are, that are spoken here, they are all found in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, but they are attributed to different nuns. So the first two stanzas are attributed to a nun called Vijaya, or rather Mara challenges Vijaya, and then Vijaya replies like this in the second stanza. And then the third stanza is found in the poem of a nun called Sela Alavika, so Sela from Alavi. And the last stanza is actually found in many, many poems. So this is kind of a standard uh, stanza, which the nuns use to, um, tell Mara that they see through him and tell him to leave. So even though Kema doesn't appear as a character in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, all her verses do appear there. And um, two weeks ago, when we went through the list of all the foremost nuns, uh, we saw that long list in Chinese, which had 51 nuns there. And on that list, we also saw um, Vijaya. And Vijaya had a wisdom quality in that list. And also the Pali commentaries tell us about Vijaya, that she was um, a student of Kema. So it makes sense for her to have a wisdom quality because she is trained by the nun who is foremost in wisdom. And also in lay life, um, it is said that she was a close friend of Kema. And what I think uh, we are seeing here, so, so the usual explanation for uh, having different stanzas and having them all attributed to different nuns is that there was a corruption in the tradition, people messed up, they forgot uh, to which nun um, they belong. 
And so that's why they are assigned to different nuns. Um, but what I think what we're seeing here is that um, students of various teachers are paying homage to their teachers by using, um, using their poems and reusing stanzas from the poem, um, um, either you know, unchanged as a way to pay homage or twisting it a little bit, changing it a little bit around, adding their own flavor to it or adding their own wisdom to it. And that's a way um, to show uh, respect to the teacher, to show how much they value the teaching and also to make sure that when they have students of their own, that they pass on that teaching to their own students. And we see that very regularly in the Tedegata. So this is by far not the only occasion where we see it. And in a few weeks, when we talk about Patachara, this is something we will see really a lot with Patachara and all her students, because we have poems preserved of her students as well. So we see that this way of paying homage is very, very common um, in the Tedegata also. So I think what we're seeing here is a special kind of tradition among the nuns Sangha. Um, so this is something we only see, we, we mostly see in the Tedegata. It doesn't appear very much in the verses of the monks, um, so, but it does appear really a lot in the verses of the nuns. So I think uh, what we're seeing here is a special tradition that was uh, common among nuns. So something that the nuns practice, but the monks might not have practiced as much. So um, I think it's very beautiful to connect um, with th that uh, old tradition and to see that, you know, sometimes the nuns did things a little bit differently from the monks and they did have their own traditions and their own ways of paying homage to a teacher. So that's the first half of this uh, poem. And now the last two verses are quite different and they are as follows. Um, Worshipping the stars, serving the sacred flame in a grove, failing to grasp the true nature of things. Foolish me, I thought this was purity. But now I worship the awakened one, supreme among men. Doing the teacher's bidding, I'm released from all suffering. <clears throat> so here we have, <clears throat> of course, um, two stanzas. The last one is uh, as Kema celebrating her um, awakening and her conversion to Buddhism. And um, this uh, first stanza here is also extremely interesting because she, uh, she um, describes the practices that she did before she became a Buddhist. And she says, worshiping the stars. And she said she served the sacred flame in a grove. So she did fire worship. And these are, of course, um, Brahminical practices and also the, the thought that you can um, attain purity through doing these kind of practices uh, is, of course, a Brahminical idea. So that's very interesting that she, as a woman, carried out those practices because, um, as we know, in the Brahminical tradition, in the centuries before the Buddha, there were women who were trained in Brahminical practices. But in the centuries after the Buddha, um, it was the, the image of women changed and the status of women changed. So it was believed that women were no longer capable of carrying out those rituals in a, a potent way, in, in, a, in a, a valid way. So nuns, uh, sorry, women couldn't actually do those rituals anymore. They had to rely on men carrying out those rituals for them. But here in, at the Buddha's time, it seems that, you know, in, in the in the testimony of the women themselves, they themselves say that they did do those practices. So that's very interesting. And it also seems to imply that Kema actually was a Brahmin, uh, uh, a Brahmin ascetic before she became a Buddhist nun. So she wasn't a householder, she wasn't a lay person. It seems that she, um, well, had already gone forth and was practicing as a Brahmin ascetic. And especially, I think the reference to uh, the fire worship is very, very interesting because as we know, um, when the Buddha started teaching and uh, converted the first people to Buddhism, the first people he converted 
were of course the five monks and then he converted Yasa and his group and then he went and converted the three Kasapa brothers and the 1000 and the 1000 followers of the Kasapa brothers who were all fire worshiping ascetics so we have this huge group of 1000 people doing fire worship and among of course 1000 people now that we know that women did do those practices it seems quite likely that women could have been among those 1000 fire worshipers so that would make the first bikunis really really early um, so that, that's a possibility that the first bikunis were actually already um, coming into the sangha at this really early point and even if no bikunis were among those 1000 fire worshipers clearly the conversion of such a huge group must have made quite a big impact on you know the the general community of fire worshippers or of, of people doing Brahminical practices at that time. So it's quite likely that people would have come and asked them, why did you convert? What's this new teaching? And get interested in the Dhamma that way. So it's quite likely that, you know, fire worshipper, fire worshippers would have had somewhat of an easier access to the Dhamma um, through those, uh, those large, number, large numbers of converts. So it seems quite likely that Kema might have been exposed to the Dhamma at quite an early time. Um, so uh, that's something very interesting that we can um, sort of read a little bit between the lines of her poem. Um, and we come back to that point later when we read her Apadana stories, because they're, they're really different. And um, now I want to move on to the second early text that we're reading today, which is the Kema Sutta. And um, the sutta goes as follows. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. Now at that time, the nun Kema was wandering in the land of the Kosalans between Savati and Saketa when she took up residence in Turanavatu. Then King Pasenadi was traveling from Saketa to Savati and he too stayed in Turanavata for a single night. Then King Pasenadi addressed the man, please, mister, check if there's a suitable ascetic or Brahmin in Turanavatu to whom I can pay homage. Yes, your majesty, replied that man. He searched all over Turanavatu, but he couldn't see a suitable ascetic or Brahmin for the king to pay homage to. But he saw that the Nankema was staying there. So he went to the king and said to him, your majesty, there's no ascetic or Brahmin in Turanavatu for the king to pay homage to, but there is the Nankema who is a disciple of the Blessed One, the Perfected One, the Fully Awakened Buddha. She has a good reputation as being astute, competent, clever, learned, a brilliant speaker and eloquent. Your Majesty may pay homage to her. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala went up to the nun Kema, bowed, sat down to one side and said to her, Madam, does a realized one exist after death? And then um, Kema gives him a uh, Dhamma teaching, which I have left out here. So uh, what we see here is um, Hima is staying in a small village. She's wandering, apparently alone, because there's no companion mentioned. And then um, she's uh, um, staying in Turanavatu, which is a tiny village. And King Pasenad is also staying there. And it seems that he was bored or something. So he, he thought what, what he could do. And so he thought it would be nice to have a deep conversation about something. And so he sent somebody to look for a, an ascetic or some kind of religious person or some kind of uh, spiritual person. And uh, nobody, nobody else was staying there, only Kema was staying there. So then that man suggests to King Pasenadi to go and talk to Kema. And we see that the king goes and he bows to the nun and he sits down to one side, which is the polite way, polite way of doing things. And then he, he um, gets a Dhamma talk from the bhikkhuni. And also we see that the way um, the woman is described here, a good reputation, she's competent, she's clever, she's a brilliant speaker, she's learned. So it seems that um, those were qualities that could be valued in a woman. So a woman that was learned, that was outspoken, that could speak in public and seemed competent um, and clever, that was something that was highly valued um, 
in a bikini at that time. So speaking in public or something, appearing in public uh, wasn't a problem at all for women at that time. Um, and then I've left out the actual teaching. Um, but when the teaching is over, King Pasenadi approved and agreed with what the Nankema said. Then he got up from his seat, bowed, respectfully circled her, keeping her on his right before leaving. Then on a later occasion, King Pasenadi of Kosla went up to the Buddha, bowed and sat down to one side. He asked the Buddha exactly the same questions he had asked the Nankema and received the same answers. Then King Pasenadi approved and agreed with what the Buddha said. Then he got up from his seat, bowed and respectfully circled him, keeping him on his right before leaving. So uh, again, we see King Pasenadi being very respectful to the Nankema, the king bowing to the Bikuni. And then we see he approaches the Buddha and he treats the Buddha in exactly the same way. So there's no gender difference at all between his uh, respectful behaviors towards Kema and towards the Buddha. And that will also be something that we come back to when we look at the Apadana stories. And um, now we are moving on to the first Apadana story. So uh, this is from the Pali tradition. And I have very, very significantly shortened this Apadana because it is very long. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through everything. Um, but I've, I think I've taken care not to, not, not to misrepresent anything um, important there. So this Apadana is um, written many, many centuries after the Buddha's time. Also quite a significant amount of time after Buddhism split into different schools. So this is a very sectarian text here. And uh, as, we, as we go along, I will point out um, all the things, um, how, we can, how we can see that it is quite a late text and also how things have changed um, compared to the early time. So the Apadana story starts um, 100,000 eons ago. So 100,000, one eon is the lifetime of a universe. So 100,000 universes ago. And at that time, Padumutara was the Buddha who um, lived back then. And Kema went to him, she went for refuge. So she was a lay person. Uh, she gave dana. And then the Buddha Padumutara made a prediction that 100,000 eons in the future, uh, there would be a Buddha Gotama. And uh, Kema will be um, the foremost in wisdom at that time. So then she has many happy rebirths. And 91 eons ago, the Buddha Vipassi arises and she went, she, she go, she goes forth into homelessness, so she becomes a bikuni, but she doesn't really um, attain any profound stage, states of dhamma. Um, and again, she has happy rebirths, and then uh, we come to this present lucky Ian. So the Ian that we are living in now is called the lucky Ian, the Badakalpa, the Badrakalpa or Badakapa in Pali and Sanskrit. Uh, it's called lucky Ian because in our Ian we have five Buddhas. Um, which is extremely uh, unusual. And the first one is Kakusanda, and the second one is Konagamana. So in Konagamana, Buddha's time, she again is a lay donor. She's a lay person and donates a hermitage. And again, she has some happy rebirths and still in the same lucky Ian, Kasapa Buddha um, arises. And in Kasapa Buddha's time, um, Kasapa has a um, uh, uh, chief supporter or an important supporter uh, who was the king of Kasi named Kiki. And this uh, Kiki king of Kasi appears quite frequently in the suttas and in the later texts. So he was quite popular in the tradition. And Kima was that king's eldest daughter. And she wants to ordain, but the father doesn't allow her so in the Pali version of this story, this story is very popular in all of the Buddhist traditions, but in the Pali version of this story, she is not allowed to ordain and she stays at home and she practices together with her, um, her six uh, sisters. So together the seven daughters and those seven, seven daughters or sometimes called seven sisters or also called seven princesses, um, 
is a very, very popular story among all Buddhist traditions. So we have texts in, in Pali, in Sanskrit, in Chinese, in Tibetan, and also fragments in ma many other languages. Um, and their story is told over and over and over again, because those seven daughters of the king um, become uh, the foremost nuns in uh, Gautama Buddha, our Buddha's time, and also Visaka, the foremost laywoman. So Kema and Upalavana, Patachara, Kundalakesa, Kisagotami and Damadina are all supposed to have been sisters in the time of the last Buddha, Kasapa Buddha. So the way like their practice and everything um, about their past life um, became very popular. And I want to talk about that more in um, another session. So we can talk in detail about the um, those seven nuns and how they all relate to each other and how the different traditions treat them. So I'm, I'm not going to going into detail now, just uh, letting you know that we're going to talk about this more. Um, but the one thing that Tema still mentions about her time as one of the seven sisters is that uh, at that time she learned from Kasapa Buddha, the sutta called Mahanidana Sutta. So apparently Kasapa Buddha, according to the story, he taught exactly the same sutta as um, Gautama Buddha. Um, and so she memorized exactly that same sutta at Kasapa Buddha's time. And again, she has some happy rebirths. And now finally we come to her last life in, as her birth as Kema. So uh, again, she's born as a princess of the mother king. Um, she was extremely beautiful and she was married to King Bimbisara, uh, the king of Magadha. And she was the chief queen and she took great pride in her beauty. She was very vain. And because she was so infatuated with her body and her beauty, she didn't want to go see the Buddha because she thought that the Buddha speaks ill of beauty. So the Buddha wouldn't like her. But King Bimbisara, of course, being a stream enterer and being a strong follower of the Buddha, um, wants her to go. So he tricks her by um, praising the bamboo grove and having uh, also musicians come and sing praises of the bamboo grove. And then when she thinks, oh, the scenery is so beautiful, I have to go see it. Then only she decides to go to Cheta's grove and to the bamboo grove. To go to the bamboo grove, yeah, not Cheta's grove, bamboo grove, of course. Um, so she told the, the king that she wants to go. And then um, when she thinks that the Buddha is on arms round in Ratagaha, at that time, she goes to see the grove to make sure that she doesn't run into the Buddha. Uh, and so she goes um, to the Buddha's kuti, the Ganda kuti, the perfumed house, and she thinks it's empty, but actually the Buddha is there and she sees the Buddha sitting there. And she sees the Buddha sitting and he is fanned by a very beautiful woman. And when she sees that, she immediately has the thought or oh, there's something fishy going on. Um, truly the Buddha and that woman have some kind of uh, unsuitable relationship. Um, and she thinks, wow, she's a super beauty and I've never seen anything as beautiful as that. But actually it turns out that the woman is just a protect pro projection that the Buddha um, conjured up with his uh, supernormal powers and then he makes that woman age and her beauty disappears and uh, the danger of old age and death uh, become apparent. And Hema is very shocked and uh, she um, um, sort of detaches from her own beauty. Um, and then the Buddha um, sees that her mind is ready and he gives her a Dhamma teaching and he teaches her, Kema, see this complex heap as this is disgusting and putrid. It is oozing and it's dripping, the delight of foolish people. With one pointed focus, step fast, fix your mind on impurity, remain mindful of the body, be intent of, on disenchantment. So he teaches her about um, detachment from the body, not being infatuated with the beauty of the body. And the teaching continues a little, a little while longer. And then when the Buddha sees that she is ready mentally, he again teaches her the Mahanidana Sutta. So the same Sutta that she learned uh, under Kasapa Buddha. And when she hears that best Sutta, she remembers the past life 
and then she becomes a stream enterer. So purifying the dhamma eye means she, she becomes a stream enterer. And then the one, um, the Buddha um, tells her, Kema, you should stay here with us. So he tells her to ordain. And she accepts that, she bows, and she goes to see the king and tells him she wants to ordain. And because the king is a stream enterer, he of course permits her to go and says, I permit you, lucky one, let you going forth have success. So up until here, we see um, her story is extremely different from the early, early sources that we have had a look at. So at this, uh, in this story, she is a, a princess. So that means she's a Katya woman, not a Brahmin. Um, an, an aristocratic woman, not a Brahmin. Um, and she, and, and actually her story, that whole story of her being infatuated with her beauty, and then the story of the beautiful woman that ages, um, is actually just a copy of the story of Nanda, the Buddha's half-sister. So they didn't even come up with a separate story for Kema, they just copied Nanda's story into Kema's Apadana, more or less. Uh, so, um, yeah, Kema is portrayed as a very uh, vain woman, just, you know, looking after her own beauty and not really having a, a, a spiritual vocation, not ha really having a spiritual interest. She has to be tricked into going to the, um, to the bamboo grove. Um, and, um, and as we've seen, like um, before in her, her Tirgata verse, it seemed like that she was already an ascetic. So she had already gone forth. She had this genuine spiritual um, vocation. She had this, um, this um, deep search for, for um, a meaningful life. Of course, she didn't know what was meaningful at that time. She was seeking purity in the wrong way, but she did seek purity. And she, she was an independent woman. As a woman gone forth, she was not um, attached to any male guardian or anything. Um, but here it's not at all like this. She has to go and ask her, her husband, the king, for permission um, to, to go forth. So we see that she's still being treated kind of respectfully by the tradition. Of course, she is, uh, she's made into a queen and she's made into a very beautiful woman. But that genuine spiritual vocation is, is totally lost. And also her independence is totally lost at, at this uh, in this story here. Um, and then the story continues. Uh, after seven months, she's watching lamp flames rising and falling, and then she's profoundly moved. Uh, she sees through the conditioned uh, things and she attains arahanship. And then uh, with her arahanship together, she masters various superpowers. There's a long list here. Um, and also she attains the, the um, deep knowledges, which is necessary for someone who um, is foremost in wisdom. Uh, so these are typically ascribed to people who, who have wisdom qualities. Um, but also here we have this verse, skilled in the purifications, confident in katavattu, and in the dispensation I've mastered Abhidhamic method. So this is a telltale sign, sign how very, very late this text is, because here it mentions the Abhidhamma, and of course, the Abhidhamma didn't exist in the Buddha's time, and it didn't even exist in the period of unified Buddhism, like the centuries after the Buddha, before uh, Buddhism split into various schools. So the, Amma, uh, the Abhidhamma is something that is specific to each school. So we know that it only developed after the schools had already split. And especially here, it mentions the Katavatu, and the Katavatu is the seventh book of the seven Abhidhamma books, so the last book of the Abhidhamma, it was written the latest. And the Katavatu actually deals with um, various uh, viewpoints of other schools from the Theravada point of view and how to refute those other schools and their doc doctrines. So it's clearly arisen at a time when the different schools already had very much developed their own distinct um, features and their own distinct, distinct points of doctrine. So we can see that, um, so that, that helps us to actually date this Apadana in time and, and we can see it is, is 
really uh, like squarely sits in the middle of the sectarian period. It's not an early text. Um, and then here we have the incident described in Turanavatu, and it's also very different from the early text. And it says, then being asked subtle questions in Turanavatu by the queen, wife of the Kotala king, I explained according to truth. And at that time, the king approaching the Welgon one, so the Buddha asked him as well. Then the Buddha explained just as those questions were explained by me. The victor thrilled at that virtue, then placed me in the foremost place. The ultimate man then dubbed me chief of the nuns with great wisdom. So we can see um, the story uh, in Turanavatu also has changed. It is no longer the king who goes and talks to the nun. Um, it's, it's the queen who goes and talks, but of course the king himself goes and talks to the Buddha. So this is interesting because both of the texts belong to the Pali tradition. And it's very clear that this incident refers to that sutta that we read before, because Turanavatu is a place that is really very obscure and it doesn't occur of, often in the sutta. So we know that they were aware of the sutta um, and knew, even though they knew the exact wording of the sutta and they knew that in the sutta it's the king himself who goes and who bows and who, who gets a teaching from a bhikkhuni, uh, it seems that at this later time this was so inconceivable that they were not able to put that story in, um, in this apadana and to they had to change and um, make the queen talk to the bhikkhuni instead. Of uh, course, it's no longer conceivable that the king as a man could bow to the bhikkhuni and get a teaching from a woman. Um, so this again shows us how much the image of women uh, has changed over time and how much the status of women has changed over time. Um, yeah, and this incident uh, of her teaching the king slash the queen um, is what earns her this title of uh, chief of the nuns with great wisdom in according to the Pali tradition. And then there are a few last verses where she just celebrates her enlightenment. Um, yeah, and that is the legend of Kemateri Kima, in the Pali tradition. So we see there's a very significant difference between the later tradition and the early text. And now, as I mentioned, I want to still show you uh, an Apadana text from the Sanskrit. And um, that text uh, comes with the slight disadvantage that there is no English translation for this text. So um, we are lucky that we do have a translation into a Western language. We have a translation into French. And the translation is 130 years old. So really um, pretty old. Um, hopefully you can see it now. And uh, so this is story number 79 and it's Kema's story. And as you see, the spelling is very strange. And number one, that's because it's very old and because it's French. And also because in Sanskrit, uh, Kema's name is of course pronounced Sema. Um, but I'm, st I'm still going to call her Kema because, um, well, that's what we've used uh, throughout, so I think it's easier to just keep the name. And uh, of course, I don't expect everybody to be able to read French. So I will just um, summarize the story as we go along. So uh, uh, the story takes place with the Buddha um, living in Savati in Jeta's Grove in Anatta Pindika's park. And at that time, King Pasenadi of Kosala and the King Brahmadatta had a conflict. And already from this second sentence, we can see that this is not a historical story, because as we know, King Pasenadi of Kosala was a contemporary of the Buddha. He did live at the same time. He is a historical figure, but King Brahmadatta is a mythological personality. So King Brahmadatta regularly appears in the Jataka stories. And um, so there, there are dozens and dozens of Jataka stories that tell past lives of the Buddha. So a long time before the lifetime of this lifetime of the Buddha. And many of those Jataka stories um, start with the words, uh, when Brahmadatta was king of Kasi, the Buddha was born, or the, the Bodhisattva was born in such and such a circumstance. So since it obviously uh, is impossible for the Buddha to have dozens and dozens of lives, 
in the lifetime of King Brahma Data, uh, that just means um, it's just supposed to mean a long time in the past. So the same way that we say when we tell fairy tales, we say once upon a time, they said when Brahma Data was king of Kasi to say a long time in the past. So straight away we can see that this is not something that even tries to tell accurate historical events. So anyway, they had a conflict according to this story. And King Prasenadi went to the border with his army and set up camp there. And King Brahmadatta also went to the border with his army and set up camp there. And um, so both of them made their chief queen come and they um, spent time together. And so nine months later, uh, both of the chief queens gave birth at the same, on the same day. And um, the chief queen of King Pasenadi gave birth to a girl and the chief queen of King Brahmadatta gave birth to a boy. And so in both, uh, in both camps, there was a big celebration and both of the kings saw that the other camp was celebrating and they each asked their advisors, why um, are they celebrating? And so both kings heard that the other king, uh, that, uh, that a child was like born to the other king. And so King Brahmadatta sent a messenger to King Pasenadi and told him, I heard that this lucky event happened to you, a daughter was born to you and a son was born to me. So let's uh, marry them, or at that point probably let's, en let's engage them. Um, and in that way, we will end our conflict here. And uh, King Pasenadi agrees. And so both of them rejoice and make a big uh, celebration. And um, because of that, the, the daughter is called Kema, which means safety, and the son is called Kemakala. And yeah, in due time, uh, they grew up and uh, the young man um, sent, started to send um, jewelry to the young woman. And then the young woman asked uh, who is sending all those presents to her. And uh, so the messengers told her the story about her engagement. And uh, she straight away went to her father and told her father, I'm not at all interested in the satisfaction of desires. I actually want to ordain uh, in the teaching of the Buddha. So please give me permission for that. And the king says, I cannot give you permission for that because I was so um, happy about your birth. Um, and then the king, King Pasenadi, sends a messenger to King Brahmadatta and tells him, uh, the young woman wants to um, get ordained, so come quickly and take her. And King Brahmadatta answers, yes, I come in seven days. Uh, please make all the preparations. So when Kima hears that um, the, the news that she will be married in eight days, she's absolutely horrified and um, very, very distraught. And so she goes to um, the roof of her, um, her, her palace building and uh, turns uh, towards the Jetavana where the Buddha is staying and she begs the Buddha to protect her and to save her. Um, and the Buddha, of course, with his superpowers, he hears um, what's going on. He sees and hears what's going on and he sees that Kema is ready. And um, so with his superpowers, he comes to Kema and he gives her a teaching in such a way that um, she attains to anagami, to non-return. So she is completely beyond all sensual desires at that point. And when the seventh day comes and the time of the hour of the marriage came close, the son of the king came together with hundreds of other young people. And the Brahmin chief priest um, did all the various ceremonies. And when it was time for the joining of the hands between the two, Kema, and it says here in, in, um, in sight of, uh, very, uh, of several hundreds of thousands of beings, like the king of swans who extends his wings, she flew up in the sky and then uh, showed various miracles. And King Pasenadi, King Brahmadatta, Kemakada, and all the other beings, they were extremely astonished and they fell at her feet 
and they uh, begged her to forgive them and um, tell her that it would be very um, out of place if she were to engage in, in, in sensual desire, in sensual pleasures. So Kima comes back down and in front of the crowd, she gives a Dhamma teaching in such a way that several hundreds of thousands of beings um, become stream enterers. And then Kema gets permission from her father to go forth and uh, she gets ordained and uh, in due course she attains Arahantship and the Buddha names her foremost among those with great wisdom. And apparently he names her foremost of great wisdom because she um, converted those hundreds of thousands of beings um, with her Dhamma talk. And then the bhikkhus ask him, ask the Buddha, why, um, like what kind of practices did she do in her past life? So that she could attain to this foremost state, a foremost bhikkhuni of those uh, with wisdom. And uh, the Buddha tells them that under Katsapa Buddha, so the last Buddha, the Buddha just before Gautama Buddha, she was the daughter of a millionaire and she made large donations and she became a bhikkhuni. And then her bhikkhuni teacher was put in the place as the place of the foremost. Um, in wisdom by Kasapa Buddha, and then she aspired to attain that same state under Gautama Buddha. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the end of this story. So when we compare this story with the other Apadana story from the Pali tradition that we we just read before, we see that the stories are extremely different in some ways. Uh, in, in most ways, the only thing that they have in common is that Kema is seen as a princess, the daughter of a king, but it's not even the same king. And she's not even married off to the same king. Um, so um, the only thing that is in common is the, the princess thing. But here in this story, she does have a genuine spiritual vocation. She wants to go forth out of her own accord. She has faith in the Buddha. Um, and um, so that's also very different. And another thing that's really different is the, the past life thing, how she, how she attained to the state of formal bhikkhuni. In the Pali tradition, she aspires to that state and the Padumutara Buddha 100,000 eons ago. And here in this version, she aspires to that state only under Katsapa Buddha in this very same eon, so a comparatively pretty short time ago. So according to, Pali, to the Theravada doctrine, that wouldn't work out at all because you need 100,000 eons of, obviously to prepare for, to make enough merit to become a chief disciple of a Buddha. Um, but as I said, this, this um, text here is not from the Pali tradition. And also it's very interesting that this is set um, um, under Kasapa Buddha, because as we've seen in Kasapa Buddha's time, she was one of the seven sisters of King Kiki, the seven daughters of King Kiki. And as I mentioned, that story is extremely, um, extremely popular in all traditions. So it's very strange that that isn't acknowledged here in this Apadana and that she's, um, she's um, she is described as the daughter of a millionaire instead. Um, so we see that, you know, the two Apadanas really don't have much in common at all. And normally we would think that, you know, this, ma this must be two different women. And it just so happens that they both have the name Kema. But um, because, because both of them um, refer to the nun who is the foremost in wisdom, we know that they describe, they're supposed to describe the same woman. And from that, we can um, sort of conclude that the Apadanas don't really contain much, uh, much that is historically accurate. They're really mostly stories that were invented, pretty much invented without any historical basis um, at a later time. So, to, um, to conclude today, um, I hope I've shown a little bit the difference between earlier texts and later texts and how the, um, the agency of women was very different in an earlier time compared to the later time and how uh, that uh, status of women has evolved over time and also how two different uh, 
Buddhist traditions really uh, differ very widely in their description of their chief disciples. So I think I'm going to end here and open this up for questions. So if you have any comments or any questions, then uh, please feel free to, um, yeah, to ask them now. Oh, and Jillian, I, have not forgot, I haven't forgotten about your question, but I, I just want to hear if there are any questions about today's, um, today's um, presentation, and then I'll address your question because that's about last time. Esther, yes? Yeah, first of all, thank you for the, for the most interesting talk. Um, I have a little question uh, only out of curiosity. Uh, did you ever come across, I have it in my back head, that uh, amongst the seven um, daughters of King Kiki, there should also be a boy brother, and this should be uh, coming Rahula, the son of uh, the Buddha. Did you ever hear about this? Um, so I heard, I, I know there are more siblings of the seven sisters. So the seven sisters are usually like put together, but they have two more sisters according to the Pali tradition. And one of them became an Arahant in Kasapa Buddha's time. And the other one, I, I'm not sure what happened to the other one. And I know there are also various brothers. Um, I'm not sure about the story that of him becoming Rahula, um, but yeah, I can try to look that up and see if, if I can find anything. And as I mentioned, we will talk about the Seven Sisters, hopefully, in one of our later sessions, or we will have to make a special session only about the Seven Sisters. We will see how that goes. Um, so maybe we will have to add one session. Because um, I actually I was planning to talk about them when we talk about Patachara, but then I realized I already have so much material about her, so I don't know if we can fit it in there. Um, and we might have to split that into two. We'll see. So if there's no further question for the moment, I will address Gillian's question. And if another question comes up, you can still ask them afterwards. Um, so Gillian had a question about uh, what we talked about last time, because she wasn't here last time and she watched um, the recording. And last time we talked about Mahapajapati and about the eight Garu Dhammas. And in the eight Garu Dhammas, it, um, it mentions about Sikamanas, and so Gillian asked if Sikamanas are the same as uh, Anagarikas nowadays. Um, and no, um, then they're not um, at all the same. They're very, very different, um, but it's very difficult to describe it in short. So very briefly, an Anagarika is still a lay person, but a Sikamana is very clearly a nun. And her position is uh, like her status in the Sangha is even higher than a Samaneri. And um, her ordination is also very different. Her ordination is done by a full Sangha of Bhikkhunis. So it's very similar, or a little bit similar to Bhikkhuni ordination, but it's not, not yet a full Bhikkhuni. And of course, a Sikamana only keeps six rules, whereas a Samaneri keeps 10 rules. So how that makes sense is very difficult to explain unless we have a lot of time. And I have to say in the Pali tradition, it absolutely does not make any sense at all. You have to resort to all sorts of mental gymnastics to somehow make a little bit of sense of, uh, of that. And I, I don't think, um, yeah, any of those mental gymnastics, don't, like they're not, they're not really, like the, people are really sort of trying to grasp at straws because it really doesn't make any sense. And um, the way to make sense of that is by doing comparative studies with other vinyas. And even most of the other traditions don't make any sense. Um, but there is something very interesting in the Dhammakopta tra uh, tradition. And um, when I saw your question, I saw that, and, and I saw that there's some interest in exploring that. 
um, I thought I, I thought we should actually add another session uh, and talk a little bit about Bikuni Vinaya because I mean I, I know it's not very interesting for lay people but if we at least talk a little bit superficially about Bikuni Vinaya and about comparative studies uh, in regard to Bikuni Vinaya um, there's so much we can learn about how, how the monks preserved our texts and how different schools um, um, sort of had a common core but uh, evolved into, into different directions and um, I, th I think that at least one session about Vinaya would be really really helpful to understand the, the broader context so I hope that you're up for that um, and I thought that um, so next week I want I really want to talk about Upalavana because I think it's good to have the two chief disciples together um, but I could squeeze in one session in the week after, and then so we push Patachala and everything after that, push it back one week and insert one session about Vinaya then. And I think uh, there are some things that might be quite interesting, and we will definitely explore the Sikamana question uh, in some detail in, in two weeks then. And try, try to see if we can make sense of that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions? Okay, if there's no question, I think we can finish for today. And as usual, we will finish with three sadhus. If you want, you can join me. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I hope to see you all next week.